Hello, everyone. My name is Jen McHugh. I am the manager of adult learning at the Michener Art Museum. And I want to welcome you to our first virtual program for 2024. We are happy to present a curator conversation, a deeper dive into Ethel Wallace with Tara Kaufman. Uh, the exhibit, Ethel Wallace Modern Revel, revisits the work of a little known locally beloved artist whose adaptation of batik, a Javanese technique of dyeing, made her work a coveted modernist trend among the New York elite in the 1910s and 20s. But as you will learn, Ethel Wallace was so much more than a textile artist. Uh, we have with us today, Tara Kaufman, who curated this exhibit while she was at the Michener. She currently is out in Denver, Colorado, where she is the Associate Curator of Clothing and Textiles at History Colorado. So welcome, Tara. Uh, we would love to welcome any questions or comments, and we can work them into the conversation. So if you can put them into the Q&A, we will add them into our conversation. So without further ado, welcome, Tara. Hi, everyone. I'm Tara, obviously. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And let's see here. Okay. Can we see? Yes. Okay. All right. So here's my beautiful intro slide. And so essentially, here's Ethel, looking fantastic as always. So this project, um, we actually started a few years ago. I think we really started getting into it during the pandemic when we had lots of time for research. And Ethel Wallace is someone who has been known around the community of Bucks County for a long time. She is practically a legend there. Um, if you read the catalog essay, um, I talked about how she's legendary because people still talk about her. She died in 1968. Um, she was from New Jersey. She grew up um, in the area. Um, but even though she's been gone for, you know, 50 years now, people still talk about her. There's certain stories that are always um, recited. You know, there's stories about her personality and how amazing and witty she was. She would drive around town without a windshield because, you know, she was broke and she couldn't fix her car or she just didn't care about it. And so she was, you know, just driving around with hair blowing in the wind. She would make this lemon butter and sneak it into people's windows um, in the middle of the night because she knew everyone and everyone loved her. So she could just sneak into their house and leave them gifts and they would love it. Um, so she's known for her personality, but her work should also be known, which is why we have done all this research and did the show in a catalog and more people should know about her. So <clears throat> what you'll see today, it's basically, I know a lot of you are familiar with her story already, um, especially if you've been to the show or read the catalog, um, but this program is really directed towards people who know her story already and, and can, you know, do a deeper dive into some of the archival material that you haven't seen yet. And it's also for people that maybe don't know her story. So I'll go, you know, over the basics, but also kind of, show some things that will give insight into her work and also her personality just for fun. So just a quick intro. Um, like I said, she was born in New Jersey in um, 1886. So she was probably about, I think she was in her um, 30s by the time the 20s came around. So she's a bit older, maybe in 40s. But she trained with William Lathrop and, you know, moved to New York, became a modernist, and we'll go through all of the story, but her work really kind of became obscure. And so all of this research is original research. Um, there's one person, Dr. Michael Mamp, who started this research a few years ago. Um, he was the first to ever publish about her recently. And, and now we've dug even deeper. So this picture is just a um, sneak peek into some of the archival material that I was working with. They were essentially several big plastic totes full of all sorts of things that she left behind. So she didn't have any kids. Um, she basically just left all of her things to one friend. And that friend 
happened to be uh, Cookie John Johnson, um, who you might know about, and her daughter, Janiah Johnson, inherited everything from her mother. And so most of the works and all of the archival material belong to Janiah Johnson, who very graciously let us look at it and display all the work in the show. And so essentially what I'm trying to say is all the archival material in these totes is all that we have left. And the work that we have in the show is what we've been able to track down so far. Um, there's still some out there, but we just have to track it down. So this is kind of like an initial project, diving deeper, and we'll see what comes out of it. And so here are some of the archival material. Like this is her paint box. Um, we've got some exhibition catalogs. This is her invitation from when she opened her shop. This is her Oscar Wilde book. We'll get to her with Salome, Praise the Gate, Grey Cat. You'll understand all of this um, very carefully selected pieces once uh, we get into the details here. So I picked these two to start with um, just to show some kind of evidence about why people loved her. So this is a picture of her car that we have. And I don't know if it's the car that people talk about, but it probably is. Um, it looks like it has a windshield right now because the sun's reflecting off of it. So still intact at the moment, but there it is. Uh, this is a sketch that a friend of hers drew of her, which I just find absolutely hilarious. Um, it didn't make it into the catalog, but it's iconic. Look at her. There goes Ethel and she's trying to catch a train. She's always on the run. And it was done in 1946. So 22 years before she died. And so when she was born, 1886, in Reckless Town, New Jersey, she has this quote that she wrote later in life where she said, it has been said from the moment I made my appearance, the, the doctor said, beware of the quivering chin with dimple. And I have memories of H2, that personalities either interested me or bored me, sometimes revolted me, but mostly that physical effect of boredom that weighed down my plump body. So you can see she's already, like, she loves the fact, she knows she's fantastic. Like, even from birth, she's saying, you know, she, she likes people that are interesting, just like herself. And, you know, she was kind of released from the womb. She wasn't just born. <laughs> Um, so just a little background on her. Like I said, she trained with William Lathrop when she was younger, growing up in Lambertville. Her father ran a grist mill um, in the area. So that's um, kind of what her family life was like. She was an only child. And as far as I know, her mom was a um, housewife. And so she grew up um, feeling very artistic. The community of New Hope and Lambertville is very artistic, as many of you know, um, around this time kind of turn of the century, it was becoming this major center for American Impressionism, because Impressionism had come to New York kind of late compared to Europe. You know, it started in Europe in, you know, late, mid, late 1800s, and it finally came to the U.S. a little bit later in the 1900s, early 1900s. And so that's when Impressionism really took off in the U.S. And Lambertville and New Hope was a big center of that. So you have people like Edward Redfield, William Lathrop, all of those big names painting pictures like this. And now that's what the Missioner Collection is known for, is those artists. But there's also some women artists. We all know um, and Elizabeth Price. Um, and then there's Ethel Wallace, who was growing up right when this community was starting. And so she was able to train with Lathrop. And so her early work is really um, very impressionistic. You can see this painting is, um, I think it's from the canal um, in New Hope. And you now it's just very pleasant spring day, bridge and buildings. And so she's learning to paint. And she's very influenced by her surroundings and the environment in her writing. She's very passionate about, um, sorry, I'll limit, I don't know if you can see this but I'm going to minimize it. Um, she's very passionate about uh, nature and the place where she was raised. And so one of her quotes, she's writing, the single sail is far off. It is extinguished in the jade colored distance. I see only the big river flowing to the edge of heaven. This theme in so many of my decorations, this preoccupation with the movement of a river, so much childhood spent in watching the Delaware, that moment of leaning over the pont bridge, watching the reflection of the moon. Um, so she's also a writer. Um, all of her quotes are very kind of florid and poetic. She's very into descriptive terms. And so she's a writer, she's a painter. 
Um, she wrote plays later in life. We'll get to that too. And um, this passion about nature and the wild and where she grew up is in a lot of her writings and you can see it in her early work especially and she really likes bridges um so this will pop up kind of as not necessarily a theme in her work but um it's in her early work and it also kind of links to this moment a little bit later when she moves to new york and becomes a modernist and starts associating with people like joseph stella who of course is known for his bridge paintings so um i just put some these are all you know, picture she had in her archives. So this is um, a bridge in uh, New Jersey. And these are just pictures. I think she probably took this picture or someone she knew took it. It was an actual photograph, not just a reproduction, but you can see it's kind of more modernist in composition. Um, and then this is um, just a reproduction of a Bro Brooklyn bridge. So that will come back as well. Now there's one letter, so in our deep archival dive, there's, I'm going to feature some things that you wouldn't have found elsewhere or wouldn't have seen yet. And one of them is this one. It's actually a four page letter that I found. It was, I think the only letter that was actually in its entirety because most of the letters were letter drafts in her archives. And so they were only just, you know, half stories or half written or crossed out and so, you really, I really had to like glean information from it and kind of piece together different things. But this letter was a miracle. It was a full letter, four pages. And so I've got, we'll get there. Um, I actually narrowed it down, but it actually revealed a lot about her and her work. So I figured we could um, dig into a bit. So um, I'm just gonna be reading a lot here. <laughs> so she wrote just about a visit to a friend um, that she called Emma Sita. Her name was Emma. But essentially, she would. She went over to her house one night, and this is the story of what happened. So she said Emma had a, had on a black cap with a gleam of gold in it, and her face was in shadow, gleamed an oval shape, and watching it, watching out cigarette smoke drifting against the black branches, we took a sudden revelation at the same moment. It's lovely tonight. Let us walk. I had a scarf to manage that was yards long, and I wrapped it around and around, and lacking a pin, I stuck a stack of Queen's lace through it at one shoulder, and it was very warm and got not in my way. So I just like this image of her because um, she's got this huge scarf on, you know, she's a fashion designer. She was obviously paying attention to fashion and she's known for her kind of extravagant clothing that she wore around. And so you can just imagine her with this huge scarf and she, this is a picture of Queen's Lace at night. And so she just took a plant and stuck it through to hold her scarf in place. And she's also paying attention to what her friend is wearing. And it's very 20s with the gold and the gleaming and the cigarette smoke um, because, you know, her the height of her career was in the 1920s. So this really just brings a lot of imagery. And then there's a whole story that she writes to her friend um, about what happened when they went on their little walk at night. And this is like the, uh, the climax, essentially. She goes, and now comes a really exciting place. And she goes, as far as, far as I know, Emma Sita is the only woman I know who has nerve enough to go out there with a thing like this. The moon had gone under a cloud and we came to a hollow in the hill and a deserted old stone cottage. The grass was heart high and tangled. It was dotted with white weaving flowers and we remembered that they were copperheads sometimes and wasps nest and things like that. But exultation won and conquered fear and we came suddenly bang into a concealed barbed wire. But we climbed there and now came to the most beautiful spot I've ever seen. Tall trees like pillars reared up and a beautiful stream. I can't describe it except that for once dreams became actual. Then we wanted to cross to another grove, and we had quite a time finding a place where we could, but we balanced on stones, but I stepped on a deceitful bunch of grass that looked like a stone and came a cropper. And it's quite a nasty bruise with some barked shin, and it hurt, and I didn't care. By that time, nothing mattered to either of us. We drunk our fill of beauty. It sounds stilted, but it was an experience more sensual and emotional than anything I've ever dreamed of. Perhaps that is how legends of the supernatural of gods were come and loved. And we were laughing and talking, not just being intense. It was as though some spirit actually came out of the trees and it was inescapable. We took hold of hands again and went through some more terrifying grass, only this time we didn't think of it, and out onto the road and past little farms snugly asleep. And once an automobile came along, but we climbed up on a stone wall before they saw us. It sat there so quietly they didn't see us, then finally home again. So there's a lot that we can read into this. One. I have highlighted in bold some things. Emma Cedar, her friend, the only woman I know who has nerve enough to go there, the thing like this. So, you know, she's she's 
kind of highlighting how bold her friends are, especially her women friends. They're bold, just like her, fearless. She was also fearless. And I also like how she brings it back at the end to their friendship. You know, they took hold, took hold of hands again. So it's very like girl power. And, you know, Ethel was all about girl power, as we will learn. And it also, the whole story about this kind of adventure of theirs just shows how adventurous um, Ethel Wallace was and how imaginative she was. Because, you know, she's thinking about, you know, the creation of the world and legends and all of this just from a walk. And this really comes to play in her work, just how imaginative she is and how romantic her perception of life is and all of that. And, you know, she's bold. She, she goes where she wants to go. Um, and I also just highlighted Kima Cropper because when I read that, I had no idea what that meant. Um, because it's like a 1920s slang phrase, came a cropper. It, it basically just means she tripped and fell like a hard fall. And I just love it. So I um, included that. And then this is how she ends the letter. She says, I don't think of nature as being at all narrow. That is, I can't see how people, such small units in the general scheme, can say what the express aims of nature are. Left quite alone, it apparently causes jungles. And if people are going to make laws at all that they respect in regard to their relationships, they're going as much against unadulterated nature that it's rather a farce when they speak of themselves as following her laws. Perhaps I occasionally feel like defending the few against the average. I should like more modesty and meekness in the people who alter it to make laws. Those qualities can never harm. And when they're confronted by such wonders as stars and life and death, I wonder at their arrogance. Do you know Mr. Balga White's sonnet on night that expresses it all better than I can? So I really like this part because it really shows how um, advanced she was in thinking, how forward thinking she was, because, you know, this is like the 1920s. Um, I mean, it could have been earlier, it could have been later, but 19, if it was in the 1960s, kind of the last years of her life, it's still pretty progressive because she's thinking, what, basically what she's saying is that humans are not the center of the universe and nature is bigger than we are. And, you know, we don't really respect it. People making laws don't really think about it like that. Um, you know, we need to have more um, humbleness when it comes to the way that we interact with the natural world. And, I, you know, maybe I'm biased because my grad school research was all about um, environmental art. And so it was all about kind of this horizontal way of thinking. We don't think about different species as being um, like a hierarchy, like humans at the top and you go down by intelligence to like the lowest animals. Um, but rather you think of um, life as being on a horizontal plane and all of the interactions should be, you know, thinking about how everything is connected. And I feel like this is what um, so what Martha Wallace is trying to say too. Um, so she, she sees um, herself as smaller compared to things that are bigger than her. And then I also just included this poem that she referenced because um, um, it just gives us a little bit of insight. Um, we don't have to read the whole thing, but the last sentence is what she references. And it basically talks about, um, you know, there's the night sky. It looks just like it's black, but it has all this light. And there's so much about it that we don't know. And so why do we then sh shun death? If light can deceive, wherefore not life? So there's more to life than we know. And another letter, just lastly on this topic, um, this is brings it back to her artwork and how this, her views and passion about the natural world um, affected her work. So this letter, I'll read it for you. I'm not sure if you all can read her handwriting, but I'm very well versed in by now. So. She writes, it was lovely today. Late in the afternoon, I walked along the low path, then up some steps and a little back street to uh, Schoolhouse Hill. Everything seemed swimming in a lovely gold light. It was so warm and nice that I sat down in the top of the hill and drank sunlight in until I was almost mad with that uh, longing to be able to paint it. You know how you feel when you want something with all your mind and your muscles and your uh, lungs oh bones here we go here i'm bragging about being able to read your handwriting and now i'm struggling um <laughs> she says i sat on a hill and threw uh and thought light and paint until the blessed earth uh, laziness got me in its grip and my painter thoughts uh turned into a lovely artist um, that drafted 
the uh, spare, like the, <laughs> like the clouds of a June day. I love the feeling and smell of, of the, the ground and the spring and half the pleasure of it, I believe, is the fact that one's thoughts concerning it are um, always in, inarticulate. It's just a dumb animal pleasure, perhaps uh, reminiscent of cave days. So again, she's, you know, saying that it's more instinctual, like, again, she's making herself small in comparison to the natural world. Um, however, um, while she might have painted the natural world more in her earlier career, and she'll come back to it in her later career, um, around this time, she moved to New York. Um, so she, she was studying with Lathrop. She went to the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia and took some, took a lot of classes, um, and she trained um, academically there. And then after that, she moved to New York, um, where she became very involved in the artist circles. And so this changed her work a lot. So as you can see, the one on the left is very different from those um, kind of nature bridge paintings that we saw earlier. This is a really urban view of New York City, the New York City skyline. And this uh, building on the left is the new Woolworth building. Um, it was constructed that very same year, so it would have been new to the skyline. And you can see um, the way she's painted it, it's really kind of a commentary on the way um, the world is changing. So here's the horizon line um, towards the middle of the painting. Below it is kind of all these buildings that already existed that are very low. And then you have the Woolworth building that's just skyrocketing above them. And it's so tall, it's almost off the canvas and it takes up, you know, it is, it's the focus of the painting. And so, it's really this really big contrast between this new, modern, kind of advanced building, kind of this older generation of New York City. And so this is 1913. So this is really the time when the United States was really picking up the pace and becoming more industrialized, more modernized. You have factories, mass production, all of that stuff is happening um, right before the world wars. So it's really kind of the modern age. Um, it's also the same year that the Armory Show um, was in New York City. So that's the big show, of course, where all the European modernists showed their work in the United States uh, for the first time. And it was you know, shocking to the public um, to see this type of artwork that they had never seen before, except maybe in re reproductions. And that really kicked off a new wave of art in the United States where people were experimenting with uh, new ways of representing the world around them. Um, and so this is John Sloan, his painting, uh, The City from Greenwich Village, also New York scene. Uh, back here on the left is also the Woolworth Building. Um, and so both of these artists are looking at the modern landscape and how it's changing. You can see he's focusing on the railroad here. Um, they also have shrouded it in this sort of atmospheric romantic light, and, and that's to kind of humanize it. So it brings some emotion back into this skyline. So whereas you have all of these kind of hard metal giant buildings that are kind of intimidating, they're really romanticizing it with this lighting and putting kind of a human take on it and really making it kind of a contemplative study. And so another way that Wallace's work changes when she moves to New York is that she becomes really involved with all of the modernist art circles. So on the portrait on the left is a portrait of Joseph Stella, who was the famous Italian-American modernist. So he was famous for his Brooklyn Bridge paintings. And again, this is exactly what I'm talking about, where it's super, super, super modern. It's very abstract, you know, it's got these shattered different planes and it's, you know, everything is looking crazy and very, you know, there's a lot of movement. And that's very, very different than what you think of like, quote, quote, traditional landscape paintings where, you know, artists are representing what they see. Um, so he's being more creative with it and his work was really um, celebrated for that. And so, he and Wallace met at some point. We don't know when, but Wallace painted his portrait. And this portrait is very interesting because it's kind of her ode to his work. So in the background, you can see she's painting um, some of these buildings and she's got these light rays coming out, beaming over his head. And it kind of mimics the shapes of these paintings. Um, and she's also referencing, so Stella also has these really intricate 
uh, nature paintings that he makes. And so she's also referencing those and like the lilies. Um, but she also kind of puts some of her own flair on it. So these female figures I really like, they kind of remind me of Florin Florine Stettheimer and her very stylized uh, female figures. And so this is kind of a hint towards where Ethel's wallet or Ethel's work would go um, in just a little bit. But yeah, I really like this work because it shows how involved she was in the art circles. And also in the archival material um, is further evidence of that because we have all of her address books and all of her address books, they list super well-known names like Gertrude Whitney, who founded the Whitney Museum. And, you know, the Arensbergs who were huge collectors of modern art and, you know, they, they donated a bunch of stuff to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And so, she, you know, John Sloan, she knew John Sloan. So she was in it. Um, and whereas they became very famous and very well known, she did not, um, at least not until recently. So sauce for the gander and the goose. Now we'll get more into, so once she gets into New York, her career really starts developing until she eventually finds um, kind of her own voice. And so where it starts was with her feminism. So in, in New York, there's this show um, that was put on to essentially raise money for the suffrage campaign. And so that's the show, the, um, the exhibition by women artists for the benefit of the women's suffrage campaign. And so she exhibited a work in that show. Now it wasn't this painting that I put here. It was actually this one listed here, titled In the Village, but we don't know where that is or what it looked like. It's another work that is lost. I don't know if it still exists. It might, we don't know where it is, um, but given the title In the Village, it was probably something of one of her landscapes. So maybe similar to something like this. So essentially all these women, um, exhibited their work in the show. And if it sold, the money would go to the campaign. And it was an, inter an interesting exhibition because it was criticized a lot by the public, um, basically because some of the works that were exhibited, like you can see all of this, they were called quote, quote, feminine subjects and they weren't necessarily explicitly you know, addressing the fact of women's right to vote. So they were like, oh, what's the landscape got to do with suffrage? This is just women painting womenly subjects again. Um, but it's not. Um, just the fact that they were even exhibiting their work at all to help raise money for the suffrage campaign means that they were supporting it and that they believed in it and they were active in it. And, you know, I thought, while well, this, this wasn't a time where women were crazy respected as artists, as professionals, they were still really trying to get, uh, gain ground on that. Um, so for, you know, the years leading up to um, the time when Ethel Walls was working, women were already, you know, moving towards, you know, gaining education, uh, getting into careers, all of that. So they, they'd made some uh, ground on that, but it wasn't, you know, totally accepted even in Ethel Walls' time. So she still had a lot of barriers she had to overcome. And so I think her, the fact that she exhibited in the show speaks a lot about her feminism and also her writings. So we have a lot of insight into her personality and her views on you know, gender equality through her writing. And so one of my favorite quotes, she says, what is sauce for the gander is sauce for the goose. She regarded herself as equally free as men. That's another uh, old phrase that I had to look up. So, I love it. And so I'll just read another one. She says, she uses talents and perception to make something, creates a perfume as it were that draws men as animals to a food scent. If they can get this thing between their paws, they can't rest until they've torn it to pieces. That's what she's up against. So you know, maybe I'm just reading into this, but to me, this kind of reads almost as violence against women. She's talking about tearing things apart. Um, you know, it's this control that men have over the art world and the world in general at this time. They, you know, they want to own the world and women are trying to fight back about that. And because I can't fit all her feminist quotes in one page, here are some more. So um, another one, you might've read this one in the catalog already. Uh, she writes, 
um, as if she's talking about herself, she says, she treated men as a cat that lived as a person would, curling against their shoulder remote as to marriage. She would not or could not understand the female jargon of cozy domesticity, spiritual houses, things in cans, was it the dull language, images are called up by the sterile quality of an operating room, quite or in its place. So she doesn't like being cornered into something that people want her to be. She wants to be who she wants to be. And um, at this time in 1912, um, kind of right after she moved to New York, she became um, a wife. So she married this man named Nathaniel Roberts. He worked for um, the nascent AT&T company, and he was going around the world um, installing the telephone lines. Um, but their marriage didn't last very long. I'm not, we don't know how long it lasted. Um, I mean, they were legally married until he died in 1930, but they separated very quickly. And we don't know all the reasons why, but it, we can uh, interpret her writing um, to guess that maybe marriage wasn't something she was really into because she didn't want to be put into this position that women were often put into with all of these expectations about being, you know, in the household, doing household work. And she couldn't, she she has letters where she talks about how she was terrible at cooking and she couldn't do it. She didn't know why it was her job to do it. And she just hated all of it. And so this quote on the bottom right is from that same letter where she writes, my dear, my dear, oh, the emotional existence like that is horrible, horrible. I was never myself. I was stupid, tongue-tied. I dropped all my tricks of personality. I was a thing and I thought it would endure forever. So not her thing. And she's also talking about in another letter, one of her friends, where she says, Robert's ideas about a wife's duties is practically medieval to my surprise. Though I remember as I look back, his comments on wives deserting off at the husband have filled my modern mind with a sort of horror. So she's very aware that she's modern with her perspectives. And um, this photo I really, really like. Um, it's a obviously a portrait of her, but she's written on top of it, Ethel Wallace Roberts, professionally known as Ethel Wallace. So Ethel Wallace Roberts was her married name, um, but she wants to be known as a professional by her own birth name, Ethel Wallace, not by her married name, because she doesn't want her personality to be subsumed into her husband's identity. And this was actually a trend in the 20s. And so this article is glued in one of her scrapbooks. And this is a quote from the article. This is how it starts. Um, the author writes, why should anyone have thought that women would stop with the acquisition of the vote? One of the most agreeably sensational features of metropolitan life this season is the band of ladies who entirely decline upon marriage, who become Mrs. Smith, Brown, or Green, but insist upon being known still as Miss Jones, White, or Farquharson. The argument on the side of the rebels is a pretty obvious one. There is no longer any way of combating the idea that no woman should, by marriage, lose her individuality, lose her own individual chance of being honored for her achievement, merge herself into her husband's life and work. So this is exactly what Ethel Wall Street was getting at. She doesn't want to get lost um, behind her husband. And in this article, Front and Center is a work by Alpha Wallace. And so this is a portrait she made um, done on silk, which is batik. We'll get to that in a bit. But it's a portrait of um, a, a woman named Miss Mary Hoyt Whitewart, who was a social socialite, and she was also unmarried. And so she is also kind of the epitome of a modern woman. And this is in an article talking about women wanting to be more independent. So this is just a close-up shot of that work. Also, this is another work that we don't know where it is, but we have a reproduction of it. So we know that at one point it did exist. Um, Jen, are there any questions so far? Uh, no, there was one about who um, actually uh, inherited her items, but I answered that in the Q&A. Okay, great. Uh, if anyone else has any other questions, I don't think so. Well, I will just continue on then. Um, so, shimmering moonbeams and signs of the fairy forest. So now we're getting into where Ethel really finds her voice. So, she, her work is kind of all over the place as she's figuring out what she wants to do as an artist. So she starts off Impressionism, she experiments with the modernist artists, and now she's painting in kind of her own take on medieval artwork. And so this is really 
it's not uncommon at this time. Um, so essentially, it relates back to what I was talking about earlier with the United States becoming very industrialized. Everything's mass produced. You know, people sometimes see that as being, you know, goods are now cheaper because they're produced cheaper materials and more quickly and by machines, not necessarily by hand. And so a lot of people, including Ethel Wallace, kind of didn't like that. And so they they came up with their own aesthetic and they was inspired by older times. And so they would often turn back to medieval times or they would go to other cultures that were perceived as being quote, quote, primitive or pre-modern. And so, you know, there's some sticky issues in there with um, perceptions of other cultures. But at the time, this is what was happening. Um, so Ethel Wallace was one of those artists, and she really was inspired by, you know, French medieval. You've got the gilt panels. Um, she and this screen is incredible, um, not only because it's just beautiful, but because she's pulling from cultures all over the place. I'm telling you, researching her work, not only because she's jumping around all the all over the place with these different styles, but also because once she gets to this medieval period, she's jumping around different cultures. So trying to like figure out what she's doing and put that into words in a way that is understandable took me a while. <laughs> um, but for this painting, so the overall aesthetic is kind of French medieval, but she's playing different uh, textiles and patterns from all over the place. Like there's Persian, uh, South Asian, like everything. Um, and what I find interesting about this work is that there's a really close attention um, to the textiles. So there's all these wonderful patterns and colors. There's armor, there's capes, there's, you know, there's all sorts of things. And here's a detail. Um, so you can look at it a little closer, but you know, like this tunic, he's got birds and you know, floral imagery, and this one's got these this print, and she's got these flowing gowns, and it's all very flowy, which you know we'll see in her actual fashion design too. Um, you know, of course, it's got cats, lions, she loves cats. And so it's really romantic, it's very organic, and so she's getting closer to what she'll become known for. And she's doing this work um, about at the same time as she starts experimenting with the batik. Um, but um, here are just a few more examples first of more of her medieval work. This one's got chainmail. Again, it's got the lion, fleur de lis. And, and this one, it's a bit different, but it's also very interesting. And I like to talk about it um, for two reasons. One, because it's very um, iconic and patriotic. Um, for the time in which it was painted, which was during World War One, and I'll tell you why. And also because it will show the relationship between her painting and her boutique work, which I will also tell you about. But this work um, depicts a soldier from a military, French military uh, unit called the Blue Devils. That was their nickname. They were they, they got that nickname um, for two reasons. One, because of their blue uniforms, which became iconic because they became a sensation due to their um, skills. So they were trained to fight in mountainous areas and they became very, very, very good at it. And they were intimidating. And so people really liked them. And so they were the blue devils, you know, it's intimidating, it's their uniforms. And they were so popular that they did a tour um, through the United States in 1919 um, to raise money um, for the war efforts. And um, they were in New York in 1919. So it's very, very possible that Ethel Wallace saw them in this parade because the newspapers reported that there were people gathered in hordes for three miles in the city and just screaming, Viva la France. And so, you know, it's not surprising that she painted this portrait of the soldier given that it was such um, a charged time. And, you know, she, when she writes in this era, she writes about how art is not made with a fierce patriotism. And so it's really um, evidence of how, you know, the American public was so, Know, wrapped up in this war and American identity, and especially because the art world was also reflecting that attitude at the same time. 
um, going back to the armory show that I was talking about and all these new um, styles of art making that were coming about. Um, so not only is it like patriotism from the war, but that's also related to patriotism from American artists because they're trying to create this quote, quote, American art identity. And so you got lots of artists kind of experimenting with new forms, including Ethel Wallace. And so this shows her relationship between her paintings and the batik work that she would eventually do, um, which so batik, um, real quick, is just essentially a painting on fabric. And um, the way that artists would do it is it's traditionally done on silk. So, and it's from Indonesia. So the Japanese culture is the one, they're the ones that came up with this method of batik. And you, if you're gonna make a work, you have your length of silk and you'll use a pencil or whatever kind of marking to make a sketch. And then you will cover certain areas that you don't want dye the wax resist. So the wax resist will prevent dye from dyeing those parts. And then you'll dump the whole fabric into a big vat of dye. The dye will dye everything except for those wax areas. You'll pull it out, let it dry, and then you can take the wax off. And you just melt the wax. And I think they would just do that by dunking it into hot water to melt the wax, bring it back out. And then you have areas that are dyed and some that are not. And so then you just repeat this process until you get um, the image that you want. And so this is um, an example of how she did some images in oil painting and some images in batik. And so you can see this is a reproduction. Again, we don't have the original anymore, but you know, whereas the painting, she's she she's using oil paint, so you can, you know, articulate the shadows and the light um, more smoothly. But with batik, you you're dealing with line and dye, and so it's more linear. You can see this this curve in his cheekbone; it's just a line, and it's it kind of reminds me of her portraits that she did, like of Joseph Stella, where it's very linear, modern, and graphic. And so batik, um, like I said, it started in Indonesia. Um, however, the way it came to the United States was essentially through this one expo exposition in Chicago in 1893. And so it was the world's exposition. They had displays of all these different cultures around the world. And they had a huge one called the Java Village, which was just tons and tons of buildings with all like a bunch of stuff exhibited in it. And Batik was really highlighted um, in there. And the American public really liked Batik. And so it took off through um, just the media and also through artists like Ethel Wallace, who were starting to work in this medium. And also, this woman on the right, her name is Ava Gautier. She is a Canadian um, woman, but she became known as a folk singer and she sold, she kind of advertised herself as a traditional Indonesian folk singer or Javanese. Um, obviously, that was not the case. Um, she was a white woman you know, basically appropriated music from another culture, but people loved it at the time. Um, and so Ava and Ethel met in New York at some point when Ava came back to New York. She was touring the world singing her songs. She came back to New York and they met. And she really introduced Ethel Walsh to Batik, but there are other people working this medium too. So Marguerite Zorak, she's another famous um, woman modernist, and she was working with Batik in New York and actually in the very same neighborhood where Ethel Wallace worked. Um, so Ethel's studio was in Greenwich Village and so was Marguerite Zorak's. And there were several artists that were in that neighborhood working with Batik. And so it's very possible they knew each other and you know, we're kind of refraffing off of each other, but as you can see, Marguerite Zorak's work is very different from Ethel Wallace's. So this is Ethel Wallace's work. So this is her portrait that she did of Ava Gautier. It's beautiful. If you have a chance to see the exhibit, you should, because it really does look like this in person. It's incredible. It's probably one of the best preserved batiks left. Actually, it is. I would, I'm just going to say it is. Um, so it's huge. It's seven feet tall. It's vibrant. I really like the way that it captures this era. It's right between the 19 teens and 20s. So it's got this really fabulous um, dress, very ornate. 
Um, it's got this floral background and she's holding a sheet of music in her hands because she's a singer. Um, she's got the shoes that are very, you know, of the era and it's just very glitzy and glamorous as that time was. And this is just a picture of it being reproduced in newspapers because once Ethel Wallace started in this medium and started doing portraits of women, her work really took off. And it was published all over the place, including in newspapers. People loved her portraits of women, especially rich women in New York because they could pay for it. This portrait probably would have sold for like about 45 grand today's money. Um, but um, Ethel Wallace didn't just paint portraits of uh, real women. Real women. She also um, did petite portraits of uh, women from literature, including Salome and even the peacock, of course, Eve from the Bible. And I love the way that she represents these women because you know, here's Eve. This is a, we have decided this is supposed to be the apple. It's enormous. But what else would it be? Um, so she's got her, she's got her apple. Peacock is just, you know, it was huge at the time. Peacocks are everywhere in that era. Um, but Eve's face, she looks happy. And so this is different than a lot of representations of Eve in our history. You know, a lot of times she's represented as, you know, regretful or disgraced, or, you know, she she is the reason why sin exists um, because, you know, she defied God's order by taking the apple. And so she's probably the most notorious rebel of all time. And Ethel, of course, was, a you know, drawn to that. And she paints Eve, but she doesn't paint her being regretful. You know, she's looking just fine. She's looking almost proud of her little apple in her hand. And um, the style that Wallace paints her in is very um, rooted in other cultures. Like her feet are Egyptian style. Um, it's very kind of um, Mesopotamian-ish. Um, and so the theory is that by um, using these various styles, Wallace is linking Ethel to the um, soon real world location um, of Eden. And, you know, she's this goddess of Mesopotamia. She's not like this sad European interpretation. She's she's a goddess. And same with Salome. So Salome over here, um, if you don't know the story, Salome um, did this famous dance um, in front of King Herod, who was her mother's new beau. And there was this man, John the Baptist, who didn't like the fact that her mother had remarried to King Herod. And so when Salome danced in front of Herod, he was so pleased with it that he was like, I'll give you whatever you want. That was fantastic. Just tell me what it is. And she says, I want the head of John the Baptist because he insulted my mother. And she got it. Um, so here's her dancing. A uh, head is back here. You can kind of see it. Um, and so this is just about women's empowerment. Um, you know, obviously it's commentary on women being remarried. It's um, also Salome in this, in the 19, uh, teens and 20s was very popular because um, Oscar Wilde had released his um, interpretation of Salome essentially. And it was very scandalous. It was like very sexual and risque and it became a sensation known as salomania people loved it because it was associated with this kind of sexually free new woman that was coming about in this era you know not suppressed doing whatever she wants and of course well we paint that as well and people loved it so here they are being reproduced in a magazine at the time 1923 and the author writes one feels that for once a woman has interpreted a woman. A woman has dared to be herself regardless of her time and environment and has visualized the unchanging spirit of this type of womanhood. The result is a 20th century expression of ageless truth. So a woman has interpreted a woman. Finally, we're celebrating. We're not, you know, kind of walking down the women. So she's becoming very popular with these works, not just amongst women, but with um, basically the whole New York art world because it's such a unique media. Um, so like I said, Batik is traditionally done in silk, but she makes it her own by also um, using velvet, and which was rarely done. And so she becomes really, really known for doing this. And not only is her work um, respected for the way that she paints women, but it's also just beautiful. And so this is a little uh, close up of one of the fabrics that's actually still in pretty good shape. You can see how vibrant it is. 
And this quote is basically a review of her work at the time. And the person wrote, her velvets and silks seem to glow with passion, shimmer with moonbeams, or sing with the songs of the fairy forest in a manner which has not been possible to oil paint on canvas. She veritably poetizes in color, vibrates in color, and her work is always personal, fanciful, and free from either hackneyed tradition or tiresome affectation. Here she is again, a pot of dye, a piece of wax, a strip of silk, and an air of boutique portraits down on the horizon. And this is everywhere. There, she has, so she has two big scrapbooks where she documents the trajectory of her career. And there is article after article after article talking about this new medium, this new modern medium of painting. And, you know, they've got her portrait represented. And this um, is actually a clipping from Vogue magazine. So Vogue Paris in 1922 actually featured her work in its issue. So not only is she getting attention in New York, but now her work is becoming popular overseas and especially in France um, and England, especially London. And so, I mean, I think it's very impressive that she's in Vogue. And of course, here's Ava. Everyone loves Ava. And she's also included in a book called First Lessons in Boutique. Um, this was published, I think, 20, what, 1921. And she's published her work and her photograph um, under this section called The Possibilities of Boutique because she's expanding what Boutique is traditionally known as, as being painted on silk. Now she's painting on velvet and it's all these beautiful bright colors and it's new. And so she's, you know, this trailblazer. And I pulled this photo as well because this is the same outfit she wears in the book. And this is actually a photo um, in the archival material um, where you can see she's wearing, of, of course, those are her own design and she's posing in it, looking very uh, fashionable. And these are just some more examples of some of the uh, fabrics that she would make. So this is traditional boutique here. Um, this probably is too, is, this is velvet, this is silk. And then this one on the left um, is a bit different. So this, um, I think she kind of directly onto it using some sort of stencil because this paint is, um, it's more on the surface of fabric and like dyed into the fabric, if that makes sense. So she's using different techniques too. Um, so now she's get, now that she's doing her boutique uh, fabrics and paintings, she's, she's getting to fashion design. So she designed this one here. Um, but to help you understand um, the design of her fashion, I'm just gonna do a very quick um, recap of what fashion was like in the centuries before that. So S silhouettes um, were the big thing. Um, this one, so this actually would have been in the 1880s with that big, um, so, uh, so, so bustles were the biggest in the 80s. Um, and also in the 80s, so you, let me back up. So you have these very constricted silhouettes, right? You can see they're wearing corsets. They have these huge clunky dresses. Who wants to wear those to work? No one does. This is actually a silhouette. Ignore this part. Um, so there was this movement at the same time in um, where women were turning to Eastern cultures for specifically for pants and the bloomers specifically. And so bloomers were these, you know, pants, pants that women would wear under their skirts or riding bicycles. And it was to create a greater sense or a greater ability um, to move. So women could actually move more compared to these dresses where, you know, they've got all these, you know, crinolines underneath the big cages to support the big bustles. No one can ride a bike on that. And so this was um, really seen as a feminist statement. And women didn't have to wear restricted clothing. They could do whatever they wanted to do, but it was seen as so radical at the time that it didn't really take off because not everyone, not every woman wanted to identify with that because they would be, you know, either they just didn't believe in it or, you know, it was controversial and they didn't want to be shunned. And so it didn't really take off at first. And so then in fact, it goes back to this S silhouette. This is um, right around 1900. You can still see it's very uh, shaped to the figure. Um, but then once you get, so, fast forward 20 years, the 20s are not like this. So you have these very loose silhouettes. Um, it's a boyish figure. They're not highlighting a woman's natural figure. It's just straight cut, has a dropped waist. It's not even highlighting the natural waist, which would be right about here. And so it's really kind of hiding the figure. And this will allow women to be able to move when they're out in public, going to work, which is a new thing. Um, 
you know, brought in by World War One, women kind of forced or able to work um, for the first time professionally in factories. And so this really prompted this new movement of the new woman where she was able to do more things and also to dance and go out in public by herself. And so, of course, the iconic 20s clapper dresses with the beating and the fringe and all of that was also related to this too. Um, so Ethel's work or her fashion designs were more closely related to these um, kind of looser 20 silhouettes, but they were they weren't, she wasn't designing for the flapper. She it was more counterculture. So she, like the bloomers a few decades earlier, she was, oh my God, is it six already? Holy crap. We've been talking about Alex. <laughs> Very sorry. Jen, you should have told me. Um essentially, she has these, this amazing fashion. Women love it. It's counterculture. It's so this is Gertrude Whitney wearing her fashion designs and um, it just really took off. And so she even did like these gender bending things where she would paint portraits of men on her gowns. This is her modeling her own clothing. And so she looks very powerful. And you know, this one looks like wings. It's all kind of cut loosely. It's meant to flow. It's meant to make women feel confident and be able to move in it. And so her fashion designs also take off too. Um, this quote, she's kind of talking about her friend sent her some um, sketches and she's talking about how it kind of saved her mentally for a bit. And so she's really connecting fashion to her own um, mental state and how much she finds meaning in it. And so she's really passionate about it. Um, Jen, what do we do here? Do you want me to keep going? What do we oh, what do we think? Well, let's see. Where um so we're at we can ask people what they want. We can talk okay. about great love, great cat. Yeah. Or were there any other really interesting? I know that there's a lot in the archives with this. Um, yeah, I can I can quickly go over kind of the sneak peeky stuff I included in here. Um I can skip the more yeah, overview that I was doing. Okay. Oh, um, someone said, uh, well, one person said, let her keep going. Don't skip. And Marianne said, we want to hear about this cute cat. So I think okay. people want to keep it. Keep going. Okay. I'm happy with keeping with keep going. Okay. Let's just keep going. And yeah. So prior to the great cat. So this is kind of the, the last bit of Wallace's career. So she's very successful in New York. Um, she's getting paid lots of money by department stores and to make fabrics. People are commissioning work from her. She's very successful. Then the, the depression hits and her studio burns down. So she has to move back to New Hope. And so this last kind of era of her career is all back in Pennsylvania, in New Hope and Lambertville. And so this is a cat that we found in her archives. I don't know whose it is or what his little name was, but I love his little mustache. And like I said earlier, she was also a writer and she wrote, writes all these poems. This one is called Prayer to the Great Cat. Oh cat, thy claws are sharp and their sheath more silky than the velvets of old Spain. I pray thee give me these qualities that I uh, may play with mine enemies. Um, so yeah, she's very, very floored, as I said, but I love this poem, not only because she's talking about cats, but because she's referencing Spain and the great cat is actually her nickname for one of her lovers. So this has not much to do with her work, but that has a little bit to do with her work, um, which I'll get to in a bit. But it's also just fun to talk about her life because one of the facets of her being a modern woman was her love life and the fact that she had lovers. She, you know, she didn't stay married. She just was who she wanted to be. And so this is Rafael Abreu. He was a Spanish count. His full name is Don Rafael uh, Gonzalez Abreu y Lopez Silvero, which I just love because it sounds like it's straight out of a romance novel. He was 20 years older than her, and this is pictures of him when he was younger, so I don't think she would have known him at this age. Um, she knew him when he was a bit older, but um, she kept all of these pictures of him. They met when he came to New York um, in the early 19s, probably around um, 1914, and she was struck by the beauty and fire of their conversation. So here he is. She paints him. I just love his painting. He just looks so like macho in his very, you know, suave suit in his Spanish background. And here I think is the only picture of them together. She's wearing pants, again, very modern, circa 1920, 
Um, women could wear pants at this time, but it was not common and it was not accepted. Women didn't really start being, um, women didn't start wearing pants as an accepted social thing until the 1970s. And so this was way before that. And, you know, he's got a cigarette, he looks older. Um, the one way that he affected her work was she made some paintings for him. This was one called the Maha Negra, um, which she modeled after Goya's Naked Maha, um, which essentially just means a kind of lower class woman who was um, in Spain. And hers is black. It might be because she had a model named Louise who is black. We don't know. Um, but we do know that she painted this for Raphael and she incorporated a lion into the chaise. And I like that because one of her nicknames for Raphael was her lion in addition to her great cat. And why, what is going on here? Okay. Um, she had all sorts of nicknames for him and she was devastated when he died. And so she was back in New Hope and it was in the middle of the depression and I, so her husband, Nat, they did reunite for a bit um, when she moved back, but he was still traveling a lot for work. He died overseas in 1930 and then Raphael died um, just a few years later. Um, so she just, she's writing about how shocked she was and she's heartbroken. Um, and she's talking about how much he, he kind of influenced the way that she thought and worked because they would talk so much. And um, she says, dear Raphael, oh my dear, not to see you again. I would have waited for you um, in Paris. And she's just devastated. And here's a portrait that she does of him. And it's very emotional. Um, he's got this emotive color in the background. Um, and very quickly, um, she... So during the Depression, she wrote a lot um, about her experience with the Depression to her friend, John Balderston, who was actually a playwright and he was involved in um, a film in Hollywood. I mean, I think it was a horror film. I'm just Googling it real quick because I can't remember off the top of my head. Dracula, no, it was Dracula, the original Dracula movie. He was involved in that. But he also had connections to Pennsylvania and they met. And so she's writing about how you know, that she's not making money and it's affecting her mental health. And, you know, she has this constant condition of sick dismay and the sensation of dropping, dropping. And I think they might have been lovers as well. I don't know, but she does write about a John that they spent time with and they kissed and laughed. And there's a sound of horse hooves clop, clop, clopping along. And there's this picture of her with this man, which looks a lot like this picture of John Balderston that I found. And this looks a lot like that man, very uh, uh, sexy painting of him. He's nude. And this is a portrait that she painted of him as well. So it's possible. Um, that they had a thing as well. And if not, they were at least close friends. And the letters that she wrote to him tell us a lot about her experience with the depression. She also writes about her other friends. This is um, she, a encounter with John that she had where she met him at the train station. And she just said she was joining a cult. I don't think there was a car called a cult back then. I consulted my car fanatic father and brother and they don't think there was one either. So it's likely that she wrote a horse to greet him. And um, she's talking about this new French restaurant, uh, Chez Odette, which still exists, and she was very good friends with um, Odette, who owned it. Um, so just a little New Hope lore for you. And this one, we're getting to the end here, I swear. Um, this has nothing to do with her work. I just found this quote hilarious. Um, and so she's writing to her friend, and she goes, Well, my dear, I had me deadly rivals for dinner. Jack thought he would get even with me for that Charlie affair, and when he thought I had thought that he had forgot his foolish jealousy began rhapsodizing one day about these foolish females. I promptly and sweetly agreed with his laudations of their virtues and the next day sent off notes inviting them to dinner. So basically he was talking smack about them and trying to get back at her and make her feel jealous. And then she invites them to dinner. So it's a very like, again, feral power, who cares? You're a man, whatever. And this is just a picture of her later in life with a bunch of friends at dinner, um, probably at her house. Um, so later in life, um, she had to stop making her boutique work because likely because velvet and silk were expensive. Um, and she, if she didn't make them, she would have to sell them and she didn't want to sell them at low prices. That's another quote that she has. And she goes back to painting um, um, 
before she started. So she's got these florist still life. She kept a garden. She would paint um, the flowers from her garden. And she says, I've been painting flowers again. I go rather drunk with spring flowers. So this, this return to this more traditional subject matter um, was likely for a few reasons. One, it might sell better with um, the clientele in the area, which was a bit more conservative than uh, very modern New York people. Uh, and also just because it came naturally to her and made her happy. Obviously, you know, she goes drunk with it. And so she's just, you know, doing her thing. Um, you can see there are some sketches where she's experimenting with modernism. She's got these kind of uh, cubist looking forms. She's painting women's body with, you know, details that maybe weren't accepted um, at that time, unless it was painted by a man. Um, and she loves her cats. She's got lots of cats. She's known for the cats in her house and she loves them. She compares herself to them. She calls her lover the cats. You know, she's just like me. I love it. And so this is a sketch she did in 64 of Bambuli. That's probably the name of the cat. Another cat picture that I found in the archives from 1962. And just some more pictures of her. And there's this one, um, quote written by someone who was reviewing an exhibit of hers, um, which I really like to end with because it says, the river still flows past Lambertville and Ethel Wallace still trudges across the bridge to her studio where her genius resolves itself into colorful batiks. So it's just, it brings up this memory of her just still being there, which really um, makes a lot of sense because she is still talked about, she's still legendary. So very sorry for rambling. I lost track of time. It's very easy for me to talk about Ethel Wallace. Um, but if you want to read all of these details and more, here's a beautiful picture of our lovely catalog that you can buy at the museum or online at Amazon or UPenn Press, wherever you can find it. And now we can ask questions. Thanks for hanging in there, folks. Um, I think we have one comment from Janet Smith, and I don't know how many people have were able to catch the Marie Lawrenson um, exhibit down at the Barnes. But Janet says, I like that reclining nude. She was talking about the Maya Negro. Um, oh, yeah. She's more interesting artist, in my opinion, than Marie Lawrenson, currently in the special exhibit space at the Barnes. Let's get this woman into that space. I think yeah. we agree with you, Janet. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, that's a good comparison. And like I said, this is the first we've ever researched Ethel Wallace. And so the catalog essay really focuses on piecing her life together and what her story even is. But there's so much more to write about with her, like, you know, in the context of artists like Marie Lawrence or, you know, Margaret Zorak. Like, I hope more people write about her. I might write more about her. There's tons and tons of, you know, things to read into her work. Well, I don't, there weren't any other questions. Um, so everyone, thank you so much, Tara. This was fascinating. I know I was fortunate enough to have a tour that we recorded back uh, when it opened. And this was so much fun to hear more of the detail. I know that you loved this project. I could just tell every time I walked by your desk. <laughs> yeah, I'm obsessed. Um, she's, she's probably my favorite artist of all time, forever. Yes. Um, so Janet, this exhibit is open until March 10th at the Michener. Be sure to come out. It is a beautiful exhibit. Tara's done. There's a lot of just amazing um, archival material and pieces of work. And uh, I would highly recommend it. And I was just talking with visitor services. They said everyone loves it. So don't miss it. So thank you everyone for attending. Thank you so much, Tara. Um, and uh, be sure to check out our other programs at MitchNarrowMuseum.org. So thank you everyone. Have a great night. Thanks everyone.